Hello, everybody. This is Mark Carey. Welcome to Steepleview Farm, live from Steepleview Farm. I'm still hearing some music in the background. Are you guys hearing that? Here we go again. No idea what that's all about. Isn't this crazy, all this new technology? Everybody's trying to learn it. I'm trying to learn it. I couldn't begin to tell you where that's coming from. Thanks for being with me. I hope it's not confusing to you or bothering you or uh, causing any amplitude problems on your end. What a beautiful day it is outside. Chilly, quite chilly, as a matter of fact. Um, and I think that right now is probably a good time for us to talk about gardening in, I guess this is still early spring, right? We've got, we've got uh, springtime coming up in a couple of weeks. We're going to be looking at rainy weather and then all of a sudden, boom, it's going to be on us. Flowers, the trees are going to be budded out completely. It's going to all happen pretty quick. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about this weather change that we're getting ready to face. Um, and I don't know, I really don't know uh, what's going to happen. Uh, nobody does. We can't really predict the weather very well. But at least they're telling us right now it's going to be very, very cold. As I'm looking across the weather forecast for the next few days, um, tomorrow, Easter Sunday, Looks like heavy rain, maybe some storms. They're even talking about some storms coming in that could be uh, kind of difficult storms. I'm not sure about the weather forecast much beyond that, but the weather tomorrow is going to be tough. It looks like the weather Monday is going to have showers. And then look at the temperatures. In fact, I think some of the temperatures that I just showed you on that chart might actually be, um, might actually be, a little bit on the high side some updated temperatures i got this morning suggested that we might be down in the 20s uh coming up this week so uh, we're going to talk about what to do about that but for those of you who like to plant and follow the moons uh take a look at the moon calendar this is from the old farmer's almanac and this is a way for you to think about what you should be planting and when you should be planting it, if you look out over the next few days, uh, today's not a very good day to plant, considered to be a barren day, according to the old farmer's almanac. But then tomorrow and for the next couple of days, we're going to get into some nicer weather. Uh, I just wanted to tell you today's show, for the most part, is going to be an interview with Michael Kilpatrick. We're going to be joined by Michael in just a few minutes. Uh, Michael is an amazing fellow. I'll give you a little bit more of an introduction here in a little bit. But after uh, talking with several people this week, we got some questions and I wanted to answer them. But I also wanted to tell you, very much appreciate you sending in any questions you have about gardening or about market gardening or farming for a living. Uh, you can send those to me on the show while we're here. I'll try to keep up with them if I can. If I can't keep up with them on the show, please send them to me by a private message or a comment and I'll try to get to those uh, in that fashion. But uh, this week, we've got a couple of questions. I, I talked last week about how it was time to plant potatoes. Uh, and it is. I mean, uh, as you as you look across some of the old farmer's almanac stories, the old New Englanders planted their potatoes as soon as they saw the first dandelions in their field. We've got plenty of those. And by the way, a word about dandelions. Uh, please don't kill the dandelions. They tend to be the very first food for honeybees in the springtime. So if you've got dandelions out there, enjoy that beautiful yellow against your greening grass. They're beautiful flowers, but they're food for the honeybees who need it after a long winter of consuming their own honey. They need to build up their stores, and they're very busy at that right now. Try to protect the dandelions. We'll talk maybe on another show about herbs and wild foraging for food. Dandelion root is a great medicine when we talk in other shows about how food is medicine. The Pennsylvania Dutch chose St. Gertrude's Day, which is, by the way, I think the same day as St. Patrick's Day on March 17th. That's when they preferred to plant their potatoes. But uh, many Christians believed that Good Friday was a day to plant. Uh, it was the day the devil had no power. But if you look at the Old Farmer's Almanac, which some people would say is not a reliable source, it also has some issues because it <laughs> tends to, uh, uh, I think, uh, be considered to be pagan in its sense of uh, following the stars and the moon as opposed to believing everything is done by God. Nevertheless, yesterday was not a good day by the Old Farmer's Almanac. We chose not to plant yesterday. We were thinking about planting maybe on Monday, but now the storms are coming in. We're going to try to get to it. But if you want to know more about planting potatoes, I have a handy little 
planting seed potato guide i'd be glad to send you free of charge it's got a lot of useful information in it about not only how to plant your potatoes but also how to tend to them how to harvest them and how to get them ready for storage um, i'll be glad to send that to you just send me a private message or send me an email at mark at steepleviewfarm.net I got a question this week uh, from my son, as a matter of fact. He's going to plant some seed potatoes we delivered to him the other day. And he had tilled up some ground. And he was anxious to know whether or not it was okay to plant potatoes in freshly tilled sod. Probably not the best place to plant potatoes. Um, unfortunately, sod is home to a lot of pests. And one of the pests is wireworms, a little bitty tiny old worm, but it likes to eat roots. It eats the roots of sod, and it also eats the roots of carrots, and it eats potatoes. And they burrow into the carrots, and they burrow into the potatoes, and they just kind of eat around, but they basically ruin them. So if you've freshly tilled sod for a garden this year, you're probably better off letting that sit till next year. It takes about six months for the worms to find a new home to move off into other ground. Unless you're somebody who likes to apply chemicals, which we don't here at Steepleview Farm, uh, I recommend you don't plant potatoes in freshly tilled sod soil. Now, freshly tilled sod soil is a great soil, but you will have weeds. So uh, one of the questions I had was, well, what do I do about the weeds that come up from ground that I freshly tilled? And what do I do about fighting weeds all summer long? You know, we found that compost uh, works a lot like mulch does in your flower garden. Compost, a good, healthy compost, is the best kind to get. Now, the old farmers used to use manure. They would rake out their barns, pile it up behind the barn, straw and everything in it. That's a great compost for fertilization. But we don't use compost for fertilization. We use compost for two things. One is to build our soil structure to add organic material to the soil, which invites the, the beneficial uh, organisms that live in the soil, like earthworms and uh, mycorrhizae fungi and other things that live in the soil that are good for your plants and good for the whole microbiotics of your garden. Uh, we like to use compost to improve that soil to invite the beneficial pests that other people try to get rid of into our garden to help out with our, with our food transfer between the soil and the roots and the plant and the fruits and the parts that we eat. We also don't like to use uh, manure compost because a lot of our vegetables are grown close to the ground. Uh, leafy vegetables, leafy greens, lettuce, kale, things of that sort. Radishes grow right in the soil. These are kind of ready to eat type vegetables. Some of the concerns people have had with E. coli and other pathogens in food uh, have to do with whether or not the compost has been managed properly. And if you're going to use any type of uh, a compost that has a manure base to it, you want to make sure that you manage it properly. And one of the ways that you have to manage it properly is you have to make sure that it cooks out completely. You have to manage the soil temperature in the center of the pile. It has to get up over 140 degrees. It has to stay there for a specified length of time. You have to turn the compost pile. Most people who are using or making their own manure-based composts uh, tend not to be as specific about it. They use it the old-fashioned way. And the old-fashioned way, of course, is just to pile it up behind the barn. And when it doesn't stink anymore, then it's good to use. Uh, we don't recommend that. We recommend a good organic leaf compost. Uh, if you want to write to me, I, I don't want to advertise anybody on the show that doesn't want to be advertised. But we found a great source. I just got another... 22 tons of compost here yesterday. Oh, actually, it was this morning. Uh, they delivered it almost at the break of dawn. 22 tons of organic leaf compost, which is what we find to be the best. Adds very little in the way of nutrients to the soil, but it improves the soil biology. So, And you can use compost to suppress weeds, which is what we use it for in addition to building the soil. It's a great weed suppressant. So if you have some soil that you freshly tilled, or you've got some soil that's had a weed problem in the past, Cover it with two or three inches of compost, plant right into the compost, and it will suppress weeds pretty much all summer long. One of our viewers last week asked me if we were going to do anything on canning, and the answer is yes. You know, I think a lot of people in this uh, tough time we're going through who don't really want to go into the grocery store and have read some of the news uh, reports that people are going into grocery stores and coughing on produce. Can you imagine that? 
uh, coughing on produce, or even if you're concerned in this day and age with worries about viruses, um, who's handled the produce? Not not who handled it in the field necessarily, but who's picked it up and looked at it and put it down and picked up more and put it down, and then you come in and buy something somebody's handled. People are getting concerned about that, which is another reason why we encourage people to buy local. We'll talk more with Michael Kilpatrick here in a minute about that. But we, we want you to know that you can buy better produce locally and have better controls and better knowledge about what you're eating and feeding your family. So uh, we encourage you to buy local, of course. But canning, I can tell you that Harriet and I uh, didn't have to go to the grocery very much. Uh, we didn't really have to stand in line or worry about when we were going to go and how crowded it was going to be. We were eating out of our cellar for a long time uh, after this uh, COVID-19 crisis cropped up. And so canning is a wonderful way for you to preserve food. Now, a lot of you probably already do, but for those of you who don't, yes, we're going to do a series on canning coming up. It'll probably be a recorded series, not part of our live Saturday broadcast, but a recorded series on canning and freezing and even fermenting. For those of you who's interested in learning how to ferment foods, it's a, it's a wonderful process and you get some great products out of that you can enjoy all winter long. Speaking of storing food, uh, when you want to plant your potatoes, don't forget potatoes are great crops to store. And we will talk about in a future broadcast, not today, because I want to get to Michael here. Um, we will talk in a future broadcast about storing food uh, and storing potatoes and how to create in your own home, in your own home, a little simple root cellar in your basement. If you can segregate a little part of your basement, an inexpensive way to build a root cellar in your basement to help store root crops like carrots and potatoes and onions and apples and how to store them safely so that they're not all together and off gassing and harming the storage of other produce. So all of that's coming up, but let me, let me invite to the show right now, uh, Michael Kilpatrick, uh, Michael, for those of you who are really, really like me, passionate about farming and passionate about learning, um, Michael Kilpatrick is just an amazing resource. He's a young man in Ohio. Uh, he'll tell you a little bit about his history in a minute. I'm going to ask him to talk about himself a little bit. But I've been following Michael for three or four years, and he's an innovator. He's an inventor. He is a, a content creator. He is a teacher. He'll talk with you a little bit about his small farm university where you can learn how to make a living from farming uh, without having to incur a huge amount of debt to go to a college or a university. You can learn it online from the safety of your home. And uh, Michael Kilpatrick is a bright young guy. He is just a remarkable success. And I can't tell you how happy I am to have him as a part of the show. Michael, I'm so glad to have you on the show today. Uh, I have been following you, subscribe to your 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 podcast, subscribe to your videos. I've learned so much from you. I am just thrilled to death that you agreed to be on the show. Thanks for being with us. You know, what I know about you is probably just the tip of the iceberg. I'd be thrilled if you would just take a few minutes and tell the people who are watching uh, a little bit more about you and, and what you do, where you came from. A lot of things about you are interesting. Tell us all about it. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, so a little bit about me is my background is I, I was born in St. Louis, uh, moved to um, Connecticut in uh, Massachusetts area when I was six years old. And then in 99, my parents moved me to upstate New York. My dad was trying to beat the whole Y2K craze that was going on back then. And that's why my parents picked up nine acres. And so that was kind of really the beginning of my farming career. And so when that happened, uh, my brother and I started with different things. He started growing some vegetables. I started growing some ducklings and, uh, you know, I had some peacocks for a while, um, but we rapidly realized the vegetables is where the money was. And so in about 2004, 2005, we actually started to really invest in that and started to grow our business and growing uh, year-round vegetable production. So that business over the next decade, my brother left in, I think, like 2006, 2007. Um, the next decade, we grew to, you know, 
20 employees, managing about 500 acres, um, selling to mul multiple farmers markets. And uh, yeah, we, we really enjoyed that, uh, that business. But 2012, I uh, went to Polyface um, in 2000, met my wife there. We got married a couple years later, had a child, and then she wanted to be near her family. And so we moved to Ohio in 2015. Um, and so that was actually kind of a, a, a major turning point, obviously, you know, getting not being managing the farm anymore. But what we did is we leased out the farm to two of our employees and then just watched them um, bankrupt it in the next 12 months. You know, it was a very highly profitable farm, 20% um, profit margin, you know, a fleet of equipment, great employees. But what we saw is because they didn't have the managerial experience, the business experience to run a business. They knew how to grow the vegetables and they grew beautiful vegetables, but they just didn't know how to run that business. And so that's when we decided we really need to build a company that teaches farmers this exact thing. How do you run a farm business? Um, and so uh, that's what we do today. You know, I have two kids. Uh, Charlotte now is uh, five. Simon is three. And... Um, we, we love hanging out with them outside. We have our whole backyard tilled up. We have a hoop house. Um, I was out right before this, um, seeding some, uh, some, some crops to get in for the spring. Um, and we rent some acreage down the road from us. So that's a little bit of a, you know, interview, uh, intro of uh, kind of who I am in a, a nutshell. And you've done all of that. And how old are you? I'll be 33 here in uh, a month or two. So, yeah. You know, well, listen, I, I mean, I'm just so impressed. You know, I started farming 35 years ago, and uh, literally wow. there was nothing to learn back then other uh -huh. than from old farmers, old guys in the community. Yeah. And I'm not from a farming community. I, my, my mom and dad didn't farm. My grandparents did. Uh, and I loved it. Always wanted to live on a farm and uh, bought this farm and had no idea what I was doing. Made so uh -huh. many mistakes. But I have to say, in fact, uh, several years ago, uh, eight years ago now, I think it was, uh, I ended up with a, uh, uh, a, an article I wrote for a local publication. And I told people that as, um, as nice as the income was at this time for young farmers and it, with interest rates being uh -huh. low and farmland being cheap, it was a great time to get into farming. That was eight years ago, right before you've started your new farm business. And uh, I've got uh -huh. to tell you, you know, learning the old way from old guys taught me a lot about how to grow things. But man, there's so much new information out there. I mean, everything you're uh -huh. doing from YouTube to books to internet sites. I mean, just so much information. People are so much better off to have that kind of thing available to them than when I started. How, what, what made you decide to switch from farming full time to, to going into teaching people how to succeed uh -huh. as farmers? Well, I think it comes back to, you know, looking at the farm and watching that fail. And, and the thing was, is we identified that there's like five areas that most farmers, well, we call it five pillars of success. And so, you know, the first one is really being able to manage yourself. Um, the second one is having a good business plan. The third one is knowing how to farm or knowing how to grow products. And that's where everyone focuses. They focus just on that third part. Um, the fourth one is the teams and the systems you have around those teams. And then the fifth one is being able to market. And so people always focus on that third one and the other four are forgotten about. And so that's why we felt we needed to develop and share this message, this system with the world. And that's what, you know, that's why we have the podcast now. We have, you know, amazing guests from all around the world. Um, we have, you know, the, the YouTube and just the uh, Facebook videos and then all the other trainings we have as well. But that's really kind of there. As you said, there is so much information out there. Now, the thing is, with so much information out there, you got to be careful what you pick and choose. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. We were, we're uh, talking about this. Um, now, I, you know, a couple uh, hours ago, I actually posted on a, a forum um, about, so do you run your rows north, south, or east, west? And it's split like 50-50. Half of the people say north, south, half people say east, west. So I'm still not sure. There's no consensus yet exactly <laughs> what people should be doing. Well, you know, I think the, the concept of systematizing this and learning more than, like you said, just how to grow, um, uh -huh. it presents a unique opportunity, not just to young people, but to even guys in my age group who love this and want to succeed at it. 
and you've got um, your successful farm business we- uh, a Facebook page. Uh, uh-huh. You publish a lot of information. Just before you came on the show, I watched you uh, do a soil test uh, webinar. Uh-huh. Um, you know, but I think right now, I, the reason I, that I'm just so jazzed up to have you on the show, besides my admiration for your success and all the hard work you put in, um, is the fact that right now, I think this crisis that we're facing has created an opportunity for farmers. I, what, what are you hearing from the members of your groups about how their business has changed uh, buying local, buying from a local farmer, knowing your farmer, people concerned about they're not traveling, they're not going very far, they're not going out. So having somebody uh-huh. local nearby they can get produce from, they hear all these stories about the produce coming from foreign countries. What, 50% comes from out of the United States, most of the rest of it's grown in California or Florida. And then you hear about people uh-huh. going into the grocery stores and handling produce. Even in some instances, there's been reports of people going in and coughing on produce. People are so concerned, yeah. it seems to me, with the health of their bodies, which is a factor in whether or not this virus is deadly or not, right? Your own personal Absolutely. health is Absolutely. a factor. Yeah. But they're interested in health. And now all of a sudden, buying local, knowing the farmer, transparency, all of these things that you and I have been thinking about, talking about, it seems like that has presented a tremendous opportunity to young farmers and farmers who want to get started in market gardening or in farming as a business. What are you hearing? Oh my gosh, it's unbelievable the demand. Um, I have a friend of mine that runs an online co-op and the first week there was $30,000 in sales, then 50, then 70. This last week they did $100,000 in sales to their co-op. Um, absolutely incredible. Now. That's only one person. I have a, a farmer and brand new farm in Las Vegas. Last year, she had 15 CSA members. This year, she has 115. Um, I've got a guy that's a first year farmer down in uh, the Carolinas. And he sent me a picture of $20,000 in sales in just the last week um, from his online sales. And my f- good friend, Ray Tyler, um, who's very successful, very consistent business. He right. said his business has tripled. <laughs> um, so it's unbelievable. Now, here's the thing. As you said, California, Florida, massive places our, our food is coming from cannot get the labor to harvest the food. So they're actually tilling it all under. And um, our lo- right now we're seeing unprecedented unemployment. So what better than those people that are unemployed to go to the local farms that are now completely overtaxed and help them get the food in the ground and harvested to get onto the local plate. So I'm seeing this as a massive opportunity for farmers. And, you know, I hate to say it takes a crisis to change people, but it really does. And, um, you know, seeing this happen, um, yes, I'm not excited about it, but I want to make sure that our farmers are leveraging it, A, so they can serve their community, and B, so we can move a couple percentage points after this crisis more toward local food. I think you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, farmers have always been the mainstay of this country. Uh, we, we, we've, we've fed the world, uh, but it's moved into corporate farming. And, you know, one of the nice things about the buying local is if you develop as a farmer a local market for your products, you don't have to compete with the big conglomerates. You don't have to compete with the box stores. You don't have to compete with the grocery stores. If you're able to market what you're doing in this environment, you're not only going to increase your sales, I think, among the customers you have or the or the or the or the constituency that you had but i think more people are now beginning to recognize the value of a local farm buying local buying healthy transparency which i want to talk with you about transparency in a minute because i know you worked at uh, polyface farm but i think that this opportunity is not something that's going to go away once everybody goes back to work i heard a, a commentator say just the other night that um, one of the concerns they had about um, the, the, the future following this virus is going to be a lot like the future after 9-11. The world changed. The way you get on an airplane, security, surveillance, lots of things changed after 9-11. And they say the world's never going to go back exactly the way it was. So if we seize this moment to introduce a broader segment of the population to the value of knowing your farmer, having a transparent operation, 
clean, healthy, safe food, better nutrients for your body, and you've got more security in what you're feeding yourself and your family, I think the opportunity I think the opportunity is there right now, and I'm glad to hear that some of your customers are actually working harder uh-huh. and but making more money at it. Yeah, and, and what it really comes down to is that the farmers that are prepared for this are doing incredibly well. Um, yeah, so I mean, like anyone that has food is being is selling out or just selling so much more. It's the farmers that aren't set up for year-round growing, aren't set up for a 12-month season, which are suffering right now because they're struggling to figure out, you know, how they get into this. But, you know, if you have an existing like CSA program, or one of my friends, Katie, um, I think a couple states over, I think they're over in um, Iowa, um, but they're seeing record turnout for their CSA too. So it's also, you know, yes, it's driving the sales now, but it's also driving the sales for later this summer. But I think the big thing to make sure that you capitalize on this well, because I don't want this to just be that little blip that everyone was like, oh my gosh, that spring of 2020. Um, I want this to be consistent. And I think the three things for people to take away is one, you've got to still have a high quality product. People need, you can't just, you can't just throw out not good stuff and expect people to stay with you. They're going to go after the quality. The second thing is you've got to onboard your customers and educate them well. So if you're just giving them kohlrabi in their CSA, they need to know what that kohlrabi is. They have a recipe, know how to eat it, know what to do with it. Right. Um, and I think the third thing is how can we work together? So we're seeing some of our local farmers to put together delivery services for other farmers and work together as a co-op. Um, my friend Robert, who uh, manages the online store side for Pleasant Valley Farm in New York, they now have like five or six vendors in their online store and they're trying to increase every single week because other vendors have been struggling too. So it's, you know, how can we work communi- communally because um, if we don't, the grocery store will come back to win in the end. You know, you know your your enthusiasm for this, plus your study of it, and your ability to communicate it in a variety of ways um, is impressive. Not just because of the volume of the work that you turn out and the quality, but also by virtue of the fact that you're you're transparent with people. You don't mind sharing your history and what you're uh-huh. doing tonight. You're sitting at home uh, giving a seminar on soil tests. How much of that transparency, did, didn't you work at Polyface Farm for a while? In fact, maybe, did you meet your wife there? Did I understand that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's a great story. I mean, my actually, Joel Southen was the guy that convinced me to be a farmer back when I was probably 12 or 13. So we moved to New York. You know, we thought farming was, a, you know, I, I was so, you know, so I thought farming was so cool, but I didn't know the path to be profitable in it because I just looked at the farmers who were losing money. Um, the farmers that told me, yeah, you know, it's five more years. I sell my land and I retire to a beach in Florida. Um, it wasn't that it was about the land farming, not the actual food farming that they were making their money off of. But it was Joel Salatin's article. I think it was in the Smithsonian magazine. And I clearly remember the pictures in that. I clearly remember the words in that, reading that, being so excited, not only about the farming of profit, but the farming of working with nature. And so that's what we built our farm on was how could we do that? And then about when I was about 25, I call it my quarter life crisis. I uh, decided, <laughs> okay, I need to actually go to Polyface because as a vegetable farm, we were transparent that we put a ton of that's inputs right. into our farm. You know, every single year we had a small mountain of compost we spread on the fields. Um, you know, and just we attract a trailer every single year of chicken compost that we would use. And so I was like, how can we get away from that? So that's what met, sent me to Polyface to learn their systems. Um, and so I was there for a summer. My wife was there. We met. Uh, my brother actually went a couple of years later and actually he met his wife there. I was actually talking to him today, you know, about, you know, um, some of the, the animal stuff that he's actually uh, ranching out in Oklahoma now. Um, but, you know, one of the things that Polyface is known for is that transparency. And, um, you know, we're actually looking at some new projects right now, figuring out some new things right now. And one of the things we want to be a focus of that is the transparency of like completely open books so people can see, you know, how are you making this work? You know, what are the sources of income that actually make this operation work and how this how the enterprises work? Because I think a lot of people get into farming and a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, this year we lost money on the farm. We, were, we lost $4,000. Well, what they didn't realize 
is maybe it was their chicken enterprise, which lost $8,000 and their vegetable enterprise that made $4,000. But because they didn't know the transparency of their books, it's not so just it just being transparent to your customers it's being transparent to yourself about where the farm is true, how the farm is truly doing. That's, that's great advice. I, uh, I know that, uh, Joel, uh, his farm is open all the time. Uh, people can come uh-huh. see his processes. And I think that in today's environment, that public transparency is critical for people to have confidence in, in food safety, uh, and in food nutrition. I think that, uh, that's important, but you teach that other side, transparency with yourself, running your business in a way that uh, can can bring you success. And, you know, uh, success can be measured a lot of different ways. I talked the other night about success in these times. Success can be money, but there are an awful uh-huh. lot of people who just want to get back to the earth. And as you mentioned a moment ago, they want to do something good for their community. They maybe want to feed uh-huh. the hungry. Uh, maybe they want to use their farm as an educational opportunity. There are so many assets that aren't considered when people think about farming. Right now, uh, I saw a couple the other day, they were parked at the end of the road in, in one of my fields and they were just walking their dog. And I thought maybe they had car trouble. I went out and I said, of course, I kept the windows up. I said, are you guys yeah. okay? And they said, no, we're fine. We just were going crazy. We wanted to get out of the house. So, you know, if you've got a farm, you've got an opportunity to use all of the assets, the beauty, the connection to the earth, the education you get, and all of that is something you can share with people. And speaking of education, uh, it seems to me that along the way, you have done just a remarkable job of finding tools with technology. And through this university that's available online, so many students run up massive debt getting a college education and can't figure out how to make a living. You can look on the internet and join some of your groups, they can join your small farm university um, Uh and they can learn an awful lot about how to get a business up and going, feed their family, live a healthy lifestyle. Tell us a little bit about your small farm university and some of the other projects that you've got going on. Yeah. So we, we try to give a wide range of things. So obviously we have the free podcast because anyone can listen to that. It's on iTunes. We have over 60 episodes now, almost 200,000 listens. Um, And then we have some of our lower priced options. So we actually also have a thriving farmer summit. So this is where we interviewed 30 of the top people in agriculture and sustainable agriculture and everything from business to marketing to actually growing crops. And that's available for free. You can go through it um, and just um, access all those trainings in a three day period and, uh, and learn from that. And then we have our small farm university and that's our monthly membership where people can go deep into the five pillars that I was talking about earlier, but also into, we have now, I think almost 40 or 50 um, deep dives into different aspects, whether it be like your numbers, um, using like sp- building spreadsheets for crop planning or um, learning how to grow edible flowers or, you know, year round strawberries, all these different topics that we have, um, you know, tutorials on building greenhouses. So it's, it's a really deep program. And the beauty of it is it's a monthly membership. So it's not like you have to invest thousands of dollars. It's, it's literally just, a, you know, um, it's less than a cup of coffee a day uh, for people to subscribe to this. And, uh, you know, we find that once people join, they just don't leave um, because they get so much value out of that and the community that we have in that. Um, and then we have some other courses as well, higher price, like deep dive courses. If you really want to like learn how to grow lettuce year round, we have a course we did with Ray Tyler, which teaches that in detail on exactly how to do that. And actually, um, I had a message earlier today from uh, J.M. Fortier, um, who actually wrote a book, Market Gardener. He's a very successful Canadian grower. And he's like, Michael, that thing you put out is fabulous. He said, that is such a good quality uh, program. He's like, you know what? I, I actually think... And again, I don't know who else will hear this, but he said, I actually think he, uh, Ray teaches better than I do. And I was like, well, that's a compliment because I taught Ray how to do his trainings. <laughs> so, well, um, it is a great course. So I subscribed yeah. to it. Uh, I, I completed it. I have not yeah. mastered it. There's a lot more to yeah. it than watching it. I mean, there are still trials and errors. There's things you've got to learn. Yeah. There are regional differences. There are climate differences, soil differences, so much but an education in a lifelong avocation, a lifelong 
form of business, the ability to support your family, the ability to feed your community, the ability to do something wholesome um, is at your fingertips. And I mean, I don't know if you give yourself enough credit for this, Michael, but I, I think you really, truly uh, offer a great deal of value to people who are interested in farming, farming successfully and uh, becoming a bigger part of the farming community. I, I can't tell you how thrilled I am that you agreed to be on my little program. Uh, I continue to subscribe to pretty much everything you do. I'm learning every day. And uh, when I'm all done, I'm going to know a lot, but I'm not going to have a great big student debt to deal with. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like the thing about Ray's program is literally the cost of the program. You can pay for it in four weeks of growing crops because it takes four weeks to get lettuce from the field to the harvest. And it basically takes one bed to pay for the cost of the course. So it's literally pennies on the dollar. It's not like you know, you spend $200,000 at a university and you're gonna spend 30, 20 years paying it off. It's literally, you can pay for it four to six weeks later. So it's, you're right, it's incredibly, farming is, if you know what you're doing, farming can be an incredibly rewarding, fulfilling lifestyle. Um, you know, it's, it's the business you build that's going to give you the lifestyle that you want. And, you know, one of the things I love is we have, as I said earlier, a five-year-old and a three-year-old, and we love the farming aspect. And so that's why, you know, we do, even though we have full-time business online, we also in the evenings and weekends, we're out in the fields, grift the kids, growing things. And, and they just love that. They just, they are so excited about that. And, uh, you know, they, Simon, every night he wants to go down the Scots, which is where we rent land. And he wants to just check on the field and see what's going on. Wave sticks around. Isn't it great? So, Isn't it, yeah, great? It, is great. Yeah. it really is. And I mean, you've got a, you've got a great looking family. Uh, some photos have been shown while you've been on here. And, and, uh, we've also talked about the growing farmers, uh, website, the infield consultants, uh, the dry your greens program. The in, and you're an innovator, so much going on. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being on here. I know from time to time, you probably get down to see Ray in Tennessee. I don't know how often uh -huh. you get down there, but between where you are and where he is, that Steepleview farm, you're invited to come here anytime. We'd love to have you as a guest. All right. Well, I absolutely appreciate that. Hopefully my trips down there will be more frequent in the summer. We've got some big thing planned with his stuff. So I will make sure that I reach out. Michael, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You know, it's, it's amazing to me really uh, in so many ways to think about uh, how farming has changed. And the one thing that seems to me to have changed more than anything is the amount of education that you can get. When I began, I went to the extension office and uh, got pamphlets and had to learn how to build fence and handle animals and till ground. I had to have somebody teach me how to plow. And, and all of the things that I learned added to my enjoyment of living here at Steepleview Farm but I have to say that along the way, <clears throat> there just wasn't enough. I couldn't get enough information. But now with the internet and with uh, Michael and JM Fortier and Curtis Stone and all of the folks who are spending a lot of quality time teaching us, you can literally get a full education that will, will allow you to not only enjoy the time you spend on your farm more than before, but you will also be entitled, I think, by virtue of that kind of uh, money that you're going to, I think, uh, be able to make. You'll also be in a position where, hey, I can support my family. Thank you so much for joining me. Happy Easter, everybody. Hope to see you next week.